there is do things because everyone else is doing it and do things because they feel authentic and right. Build a company that feels right to you. Talk about the, the Canva value of being a force for good um, and how that's come about and introducing, I think, quite early into Canva's journey that um, culture and talk about the 1% pledge and um, the things you've done there and, and, you know, to the audience of, you know, it's never too early to, to think about. Absolutely. So we've got a two-step plan, <coughs> two very, very simple steps. Step one, build one of the world's most valuable companies, making progress. Still got a way to go. And step two, um, do the most good we can do. And I, I personally think that we underappreciate the importance of startups and companies. And I mean, I guess they're not mutually exclusive, <laughs> um, but investors and the media um, and obviously the government, but every single person's power to shape the world that we live in. The products that you're building are literally shaping the world. Um, and I think that it's absolutely everyone's responsibility to be able to do as much good as we possibly can. Um, there's not, you know, you can't make profit or be good. Actually, we need all of these different institutions and entities to be working together to, to build the world that we live in. Um, I feel like we're so early in our, in our journey. Um, you know, it brings me great pride in seeing the nonprofits that Canva is helping and the small businesses Canva is helping. Um, but there's just, you know, we've got this non-profit program, which I'd implore you all to do if you have, if, if you have that potential, where you can give away your product to free, for free to non-profits. Um, and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different activities and things that we've done over the years, um, but there's just so much more that we want to do in the years to come, which you hopefully be hearing about in, in time. Excellent. Canva started ballpark 2012-ish, and you somehow got an American investor to buy into the original idea, the yearbook idea, or to the Canva idea? The Canva idea. Who was that investor and how did you meet them? Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned before uh, an investor, Bill Tai. He was in Perth. Um, Bill Tai, kite surfing Bill Tai. Bill, kite surfing Bill Tai, yeah. Oh, I know Bill. He retired, rich, yeah. <laughs> he's still doing things, lots, lots he's, of things. He's doing a lot of kite surfing, apparently that's from his true. Instagram. Yeah, that's very true as well. He's the kite surfing VC. He was at Charles River Ventures, Correct. CRV. Yes. And then he left because he had some spectacular investment. I can't remember which one it was, but anyway, he, so you, you met him? Yeah. So he was in Perth and I met him at a conference and we had a five minute chat and um, he said, yeah, if I went to Silicon Valley, he'd meet with me. And so I jumped on a plane to Silicon Valley. Actually, truth be told, I emailed him a number of times asking him to sign an NDA and he kind of didn't respond to my emails. Um, I guess so <laughs> in retrospect, you, not really that surprisingly. You're like, well, yeah, that is like the 101 know, rookie mistake of founders. I, okay, admittedly, I made every single rookie mistake under the sun. Because I, yeah. I mean, I didn't even know about right. startups or venture capital. I didn't even, yeah, he was the first one that I'd met, I think. Right. So you, and in the event, he was speaking or something like that. And you just, what, like stage dived or just grabbed him in the hall and we're like, hey. I'm, yeah, went I'm up Melody to him Andre. afterwards and had a, had a little chat. And um, yeah. He, and how old are you at the time? You said you were 19 or 20? Um, so I'd had a company for a couple of years. So I must have been about 21, something like that. So 20. Bill Tai is this major baller, American venture capitalist. Yeah. You accost him in the hallway and say, can I get five minutes? And then he says, email me. Uh, if you come to Silicon Valley, I'll meet with you. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I messaged him a few times, didn't get much of a response. And then I was like, okay, well, hey, I'm going to be in the area. I was totally not going to be in the area, but I'm going to be in the area. Like, do you want to catch up? And he was like, yes. Such a power move. <laughs> Such a power move. You said, I'm going to be in the valley. Yeah. Uh, next week, would you like to get coffee? Exactly. So now you took the social pressure off of him of, oh my gosh, he's flying thousands of miles at some huge expense. I did this exact same thing yeah. with Jeff Bezos. Oh, really? I had uh, met Jeff and I was doing Weblogs Inc., which was mm -hmm. Engadget and Autoblog and all these blogs. And I was with my partner, Brian. I said, I think Jeff Bezos will invest because we have Mark Cuban and Mark and going to invest and we're going to get Bezos. I'm going to email him next week. You have anything on your calendar? I said to my co-founder, I said, no. So I emailed him. I said, hey, Jeff, nice seeing you at this conference. Same exact story. I'm going to be uh, in your area on Tuesday and Wednesday next week. Uh, would love to tell you more about what we're doing with Engadget and Autoblog and Joystick. And he wrote back in like under an hour and was like, sure, uh, this person will set it up. We nice. went 
And they said he has 20 minutes and he spent an hour and 20 minutes with us. Ah, oh, congrats. But it was the same exact playbook. <laughs> yeah. And so what happens in that meeting? You show him the prototype or you just explain to them broad strokes, here's the plan? So with my first company, it was in my mom's living room. We had a printing press because we were physically printing these yearbooks. So I became an amazing print operator, like wow. changing print cartridges and changing um, the paper and we actually for three months a year did this 24-7 um, and so it was a pretty intense experience but anyway that the point of that story was that I had a printing press so I printed off my pitch deck on paper wow. the future of publishing the future and, of publishing <laughs> yeah. wow grandiose and, and I um I sat down with Bill it was on U University Avenue University Cafe um, yeah of course which is now shut down which I'm kind of disappointed about yeah. but side note so this is a very Silicon Valley <laughs> moment very silicon valley and i sat down i was super like nervous right. i would actually was terrified and sat down and was like okay like trying to eat my lunch i'd read that if you mimic someone's body language they like you more and he had his Is that right apparently apparently wow. builds empathy i think it's called mirroring mirroring yeah exactly this is what therapists do <laughs> oh is it also cult leaders okay yeah oh, that's interesting and founders of companies well when you're trying to make someone like you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and so he but he was sitting there with his like arm behind his chair and I was like, okay, so I'm going to try and sit with my arm behind my chair. So now you're like man spreading and getting the arm out and there. And trying to eat my lunch and trying to flick through the future of publishing while trying to sell the vision of the future of publishing. And he was very unattentive. He didn't, didn't seem to be interested at all. He was on his phone. And I was <laughs> oh like, my oh my God, this is the worst thing ever. I have completely flopped. And um, But I went back and he messaged me and he said that um, he'd be happy to invest if I could find a tech team. And so he'd also introduced me to Lars Rasmussen who co-founded Google Maps and I met up with him the next day mm -hmm. and I chatted to him for hours and we realized like there was a lot of alignment in like what we believe the future of communication would be like um, and he was really happy to help find a tech team. But what this actually entailed was just me trying to bring every single engineer I met um, on LinkedIn, met on the bus, just like yeah. literally any anyone I would, that would possibly join my tech team and him rejecting them just time and time and time again. And it was incredibly frustrating because this went on for a whole year of him just being like, nope, <laughs> like this person's not good enough. You've got a really hard technical project. You need to have someone amazing that's like wow. built a huge scalable platform before. And like that was really frustrating because I wanted to get started on the future of publishing. Right. Um, but then eventually, after a year, ended up finding our amazing co-founder, Cameron Adams, and our CTO, Dave Herndon, um, and eventually got to work. So they forced you to find a tech team. Yeah. And they were right. They were. Actually, I'm, I'm really, truly grateful for that pain. Yeah. <laughs> it is, you know, it's so funny because, number one, I always tell investors turn your phone off in meeting. It's just such a bad <laughs> oh, look. Oh, so what he was actually doing was introing me to people. So oh, really? I should have told you that So part. you found out yeah. after so that. Afterwards, I realized he was actually trying to connect me with his network. I think the, th the reality is when you are rejected, you feel a lot like giving up and stopping because that is kind of a natural human reaction because that feels really, really awkward when you are rejected. But I think what's really important is to persevere and continue and continue again and get rejected and rejected again, which feels completely outrageous and like the exact opposite of what feels natural. Because rejection is hard. And trying again and being told that something isn't working, that you don't have whatever it is that you need, it doesn't really feel like you should try and try again. But what I want to do today is to show that rejection and perseverance are two very critical ingredients to succeed at literally any goal that you put your mind to. So I'm going to share our story today, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about dreaming, and we're going to do a little fun workshop. So it wasn't that long ago that I was at university in Perth, Western Australia, and I was teaching design programs and thought they were really, really hard and complicated. Um, and there was this whole crazy world. So usually you'd have to go purchase Adobe, then study design for a while, then purchase and download stock photos from a stock photography library and purchase fonts from a font library and purchase layouts and defect each image and prepare vectors and illustrations and then design. You take all those ingredients and actually create design. Then upload and email the PDF and then make revisions and then prepare it for web or print. Thought this was crazy. And that in the future, this entire design ecosystem should be integrated into one page and made accessible to the whole world. Um, so who's used a professional design tool before? Yeah, quite a few of you. Um, 
it's crazy just how complicated they are. There's also lots and lots of big companies, obviously Microsoft and Google and you know a couple of other ones in there. Um, but then lots of other companies like stock photography sites and stock layout sites and font foundries and file sharing services and professional print companies thought that was ridiculous. They should be integrated in, into one page. Um, sh you should be able to have one click access to all the professional design tools, a library of millions of images, a design marketplace. You should be able to collaborate online. And then finally, you should be able to click a button and export it to a video or a social media platform or a website or a presentation. Um, you shouldn't have to use different tools for each of these things. Not a bad vision, hey? I thought it was pretty cool. But the reality was that I was 19 and I was at university and I had no business experience or software experience or marketing experience or literally any relevant experience. So my boyfriend became my business partner. We took over my mum's living room um, and set to work. Um, and created, rather than trying to take on the entire world of design at this point in time, decided to take on school yearbooks in Australia. This is us standing very proudly with our very first website. Um, and the, we then took over my mum's entire living room, an entire house. Um, we ended up with printing presses, you can see in that photo there. Um, we had printing presses and staff, and then we started taking over her garage and ended up with that being our storeroom of ink and paper and waste cartridges, um, and had deliveries of trucks with paper, because we were printing these yearbooks. Um, and yeah, then we started a tradition which we've continued today, which I particularly like, which is having lunch together um, every day. And that's a really fun because you get to know people um, outside your, um, in, as human beings rather than just as um, team members. And we started to take increasingly dorky photos. Um, <laughs> but this was us with our growing team um, with, that, with that, some of the first yearbooks that we had created. Um, and then we were just doing absolutely everything under the sun in order to help expand this. So um, I made all of these banners and we were going to expos. It was a fail. Don't, don't go to an expo where there are more <coughs> exhibitors than there are attendees. That did not work so well. Um, <laughs> but we're just trying everything we possibly could. Um, and I even went in this Inventor of the Year competition. It was called um, WA Inventor of the Year, so we wanted to sound really inventory. So this was the title, The World's Most Sophisticated and Easy to Use Multi-User Publishing System. Well, that sounded pretty cool. Um, and then I also was trying to look really professional, so I started wearing business suits to every single meeting. Um, but we came runner-up in WA Inventor of the Year. Um, and met this guy called Bill Tai, who was over from Silicon Valley. He was this investor from Silicon Valley. And despite the fact we'd had a company for a number of years, we had not um, heard much about the whole venture capital world or the whole startup world. Um, and so this was really like a whole new window into another world. Um, and so I put together another deck, uh, The Future of Publishing, and talked about the convergence of industries and how we were going to beat Google Docs and Microsoft Web Apps, who was totally chained to the old way of doing things, and we're going to become the dominant online publishing system of the future. Um, Bill said that if I met with him, he'd be happy. Um, if I went to San Francisco, he'd be happy to meet with me. So I went to San Francisco um, and just got rejected a lot. Um, <laughs> so it was really... Um, so I was pitching people, trying to get them to join my tech team. I was pitching investors, trying to get them to invest. And most people were saying that for various reasons, and there were many, uh, that they weren't really quite ready. Unfortunately, right now, I do not think that it is quite the right fit just now. We have reached the conclusion that the $8 million cap is above the top end of what we think is fair value. My biggest issue is physical distance. A lot of people said that they need to be able to ride their bicycle to our office, and they couldn't really do that from Silicon Valley, um, and et cetera, et cetera. They weren't happy to invest in an Australian startup. So many other reasons. And each of these hurt a lot. Um, and you know, I'm not sure it's going to make sense just right now. Other people told us that um, the size of the, the market, does a design product for non-designers was just like an oxymoron. Why would you do that? <laughs> um, there were so many rejections, and each one of them really hurt. Um, and I asked the question that, uh, in, at the start, who has been rejected, and pretty much everyone stood up, and who feels like giving up? And half of you sat down. Well, I'd be in the half that sat down because rejection really hurts. But I think that what you feel like doing 
and what you kind of need to do to actually get to that goal can sometimes be quite opposite things. So we persevered for years. It was actually three years between first meeting an investor, Bill, and then actually landing investment. Um, but then eventually we raised our seed round and we were extremely excited um, because all of a sudden we could start to grow our team. And we did. And we started, after a year of development, to be ready to launch Canva to the world. And we were so incredibly excited to finally get Canva out into the world. And then we started to grow our community. And after one year, we had 1.3 million designs created per month. And our team was excessively excited about this. <laughs> and after two years, we had 5.8 million designs created per month. You can see those 1 million designs looked really tiny. Um, and if you kind of go like five years back from the start of that graph, that's really where the journey really began. And now after five years, we have an incredible team of 700 people across the globe. And give me a drum roll, so you just a little look. Yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. Now after t we have 110 million designs created per month. It's pretty wild. In fact, yesterday, five million designs were created. Um, this is in 190 countries across the globe. Um, this is everyone getting their small business off the ground, creating a school assignment, creating a presentation, social media graphics, marketing materials. That entire vision that we have initially had has actually started to come true, which is completely crazy and really, really exciting. Um, you know, we've had 1.8 billion designs being created now. Um, every month, more than 20 million people are using Canva. And we have this incredible team. We've got you know, 700 members and you know, a few offices across the globe. And last night I was searching for Love Canva, and there's just so many people saying that. It's really, really cool to see. We've got 30,000 nonprofits where we give our, non our paid product away for free, um, and the number of nonprofits that are using the product um, to help really get to their mission and to be more effective um, is incredibly cool. We also have su support of some really incredible investors. A number of them will be in the room today. <coughs> I guess, despite the fact I was trying to tell you about the pain and the rejection and the problems and the trials and the tribulations over the last 10 years, that was 10 years in a tiny little nutshell. And that really was my highlight reel. And that's why I love this quote so much. Um, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes footage with everyone else's highlight reel. I think that you know, a philosophy that I've always held um, is that trying to provide as much value as you possibly can and trying to solve a problem. And uh, so rather than having ads feeling like ads or um, marketing materials feeling like marketing materials, trying to provide as much value and imbuing that with, with as much value as you can. And I think that that philosophy resonates now more so than ever before. People don't want to be so, sold to, but they want to be helped. Um, and so I guess that's why we've invested so heavily in things like our design school to help people to learn to design um, and in our education resources and materials. And so I think that, you know, for every blogger or small business that are, tr are trying to get their name out there, if there's different ways that they can actually help their community, I think now it resonates more than ever before. Canva is a, has a freemium model, right? It's, it's, you can, and I'm sure a huge number, maybe most of your users are using the free version. It's really great. You have access to thousands of photos and a bunch of features. It's free. Um, and then there's a subscription. I think it's like 10 bucks a month in, in the U S and then 30 bucks a month for a premium one. Um, but how do you like Spotify offers a free, a, a freemium version, but they have advertisements. So how do you, how do you monetize the free version of Canva? I guess it goes back to what I was saying before around giving as much value as you can. Um, and so that's been one of our philosophies right from the early days was we want to ensure that people are able to get heaps of value from Canva and there's no blockers. And so we made Canva completely free. Um, you can go you can go and purchase some images, you can upgrade to the free version. But if you are wherever you are in the world, whatever your economic situation, we wanted to ensure that you had access to design. Um, early on, I remember trying to get a um, brochure design. I thought it was going to cost a thousand dollars. I was like, who can afford a thousand dollars for a brochure design? Um, and I guess that's why we wanted to ensure that 
everyone had access to great design. And so um, it wasn't something that only a few people can go and afford. And so I guess that's exactly why we have a free version. And it's so philosophically important to Canva. And essentially the free version is funded by the people who are paying for the subscriptions, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think one of the really magical things Canva has done is uh, had that mentorship level at the team team level. So to have advisors and mentors, not just to the founders, mm -hmm. but to the team talk about how that came about and um, how that's worked so far and uh, perhaps advice for people in the audience. Yeah, absolutely. So something that we believe very much in is rather than having um, like Cliff and I and Cam, um, having everything channeled through us, trying to get as much um, leadership going into our teams as we possibly can. So we consider ourselves 18 startups at Canva, and if we can make, and I think 13 of those are product uh, startups, okay. and then five of those are platform startups that help to make those other ones succeed. And the way, because we're trying to take on so much as a company, it's been really critical to try to help set these up for as much success as possible. And so each of the groups at Canva has big missions and goals that they're working towards. Um, and so, for example, when we did our internationalization strategy, um, our international team got mentorship from um, the head of Pinterest international strategy. And so we were able to have each of our different uh, groups at Canva really learning from the world's best. Um, and yeah, that's been a really helpful model um, that we'll continue to do hopefully forevermore. We talked a little bit about the, the management structure and, and the 18 um, uh, teams how has that changed over time and how have you sort of adjusted it and fine-tuned it? Yeah. So in our early days, um, we were one team and we had one goal, which was launch Canva. Um, and then we started to grow and we're about 20 people, I think, I think, you know, 20, 30 people. And we start to be like, hang on a second, we're not achieving as much per person as we had done in the early days. Um, and it was at that point in time that we decided to split into smaller teams and to each have those mission and goals. I showed you one of the posters that we put on the wall. But I think sticking up the goals on the wall was a really critical thing because it meant that we all had alignment, sort of helped to distill the noise from uh, the goals from the noise of the day to day, um, and that was sort of the starting point for uh, forming into these uh, different teams. And then we had we had I think 80 teams at one stage, and then we had to split those teams into groups. So now we have groups of teams, but now we're actually starting to think. Now we're almost getting too many groups, and so I think we're about to have groups of groups. <laughs> so it's a continue. It's like kind of cells dividing. Um, you just have to continuously evolve um, as, as your company grows. And what about the the idea of platform teams and um, uh, obviously on the technical side, but also, you know, the finance team and uh, sort of the, the nuance around the platform team versus product team. Right? Yeah, so something that we did with our finance and legal group, um, we just started doing it last year, was that each of our groups would have their own P&L. Um, and so we started to really think about our platform groups as a startup incubator for the other groups in the company. Um, so we have like a brand and marketing group that is helping each of the different other groups to have the best brand and marketing in the world. Um, and so starting to think about how can we spin up multi-billion dollar um, companies as quickly as we can so we have a coaching team that helps with like psychological safety and activities um, so yeah it's still it's constantly a work in progress I definitely should should note that every single thing we're doing is constantly being improved and constantly being refined um, but yeah that strategy has been working well has being a young woman disadvantaged you in any way? And also, wow, I'm 12, and how soon can I start on a big idea? I love oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll start with the 12 uh, aspect. So I was 14, and I had the tiniest business ever. I made scarves, and I sold them to women's shops around Perth. Um, and this was terrifying for me at the time. I would have to call up these shops, and I'd be like, do you want to take my scarves on consignment? I learned that word. Consignment means you give it to them, but they don't pay until it's sold. Um, and it was very, very helpful because I think that that started me to think like, well, firstly, when people said no, despite the fact it was really painful to try again. Um, and secondly, it started to re make me realize that I could actually create a little business. Um, and so it's definitely not too young to start. 12 is a great time to start. Um, and on the, on the gender front, I think you know, there's so many different aspects. If you look at the probability of Canva succeeding, if you look at you know, the fact of, that I was from Perth, that I was a female, that I was whatever age, that I was, you know, every single factor, like we ticked literally none of the bo normal boxes. Um, and so I think if I was looking at the statistical probability that I would have succeeded, it's 
probably zero, <laughs> like quite literally, uh, maybe like many, many decimal points. Um, so yeah, I think you just can't let that, you know, you're going to get rejected. And I think that what I was trying to communicate today is that is not because of any particular factor. That's just because that's the same for everyone. And I, I wrote a blog post recently about this was that most people, if you're rejected, it feels like a personal attack. And I think that if you have a reason why you think that that rejection may be because of, and that's something that isn't something that you can control, that would be really disempowering. And so it's really important to think that any rejection is based on something you can control, because then you can fix that. And so for us, it was like, we're going to fix this deck. We're going to keep fixing this deck over and over again. Um, and that meant that we really had that internal locus of control, which meant that we felt like we could succeed. <laughs>